On this episode of InCycle, we assess the favourites heading into this Giro d'Italia with cycling's leading journalists. Most of the star stage races in the world are riding the Giro, and not only are they riding the Giro, but they are making the Giro their main target of the year. Multidisciplined Yolanda Neff on her love of cycling. For me, racing on the road is just very, very exciting. And also, I think that for my training, it's a great help because the intensity is different. It's longer, but at the same time, it's more intense. But before all of that, we revisit last year's Italian Grand Tour with Simon Yates. Italy 2018, one of the world's biggest races, the Giro d'Italia. From Jerusalem to Rome, cycling's best took on over three and a half thousand kilometers of grueling roads. The breakthrough rider of that year's first Grand Tour, Englishman Simon Yates. And now, a big acceleration by Simon Yates. What a dominant performance this is. Our team on the road was, uh, you know, very committed. I think once we took the jersey, we all raised to a new level um, during the race. Just everything around it was, you know, we were very, we, we had so much success. I think we've never had so much success uh, as a team before. It was just a really great time. It is a day again for Simon Yates and Amalia Rosa takes the stage. What a win by Simon Yates. Pino second, Chavez third. I had the many favourite moments, actually. Um, I really enjoyed my time racing in, uh, in the Giro. It was my first time doing the Giro, and, you know, of course, I would like to go back, like everybody knows now. But to really pick out a favourite moment, I think it's difficult. Of course, one of my stage wins, you know. But I have so much many, so many memories, uh, great memories from that, that uh, to choose only one would be very difficult. As we speak on the air, he's struggling or dropping back. But Yates, look, Yates, he's, oh, he's right near the back. Yates, you know pink what? jersey. That's not good. That's not good. He was in about eighth or ninth wheel, perhaps. He's not feeling too good. Quite often, you see riders just give themselves a little bit of a sliding space, but he's moving towards the back of this group oh. now. For Simon Yates, glory was just out of reach, dropping back in stage 19. Chris Froome claimed victory with an 80-kilometer solo break, taking the stage and the pink jersey. And that left the Mitchelton Scott rider almost 40 minutes behind in the GC, a time he would never recover. Yeah, of course, we learned a lot of small mistakes that we did at, at the Giro. Um, I rectified them already at the Vuelta, or oh, I believe so. Um, not just me as a person, but me, uh, we as a team. I think we, we really came back um, ready, fresh, with some small changes, and that's made all the difference. So the way I look at it, we, we try and approach it the same way, and we go from there. I've arrived this, this season, uh, this winter, with a lot of motivation, very focused, more focused than I've ever had before. And obviously this is 100% for the Giro. So we will see, you know, like I've been saying before, you don't really know until you arrive. You don't know how your rivals arrive, but I'm doing everything I can to, to be ready for the race. Performance wise, not much is changing. Um, you know, I already arrived there in great condition. Um, it was more the tactics that we, 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 will, we will need to change. And of course, every race is different, so you don't know until you, until you arrive. Um, you know, how the other, the other riders arrive, the conditions of the race. Um, there's many factors that go into it. Um, but performance-wise, training-wise, it will be very similar. It's already worked twice, more or less. First at the Giro, except for two days, and at the Vuelta. So we'll just repeat that. With the 2019 Giro just around the corner, Yates will be back. 
Will the Malia Rosa be his come June? Or will it be heartbreak again? My first race was when I was six years old. Um, so it was all thanks to my dad. He was a road cyclist back in the days and he always loved cycling. He still loves cycling. And then one day there was just a kids race at the same event that he did anyway. So we were there already. And so we were like, oh yeah, why not? I always loved mountain biking so much. It was always like my dearest hobby. I was like, when I was in school, I was longing to get out, to go home and, and go for a ride with all my friends, with the group. And yeah, it's always what I've loved. And I always thought, yeah, I will do school and then I will go to university or I will do this or I will do that. Like, then I just loved riding my bike and I like, kept winning and winning and then at one point it was just like natural that like yeah cycling was my life. Yeah my highlight in mountain biking in my career so far is definitely becoming world champion in 2017 in Cairns. Um, that was yeah just such a good race for me I, I felt amazing and it's surely like winning the World Cup that like the overall in 2014 when I was the youngest winner ever that was a standout moment too for me but I guess like winning the rainbow stripes that's what I will remember forever I would love to win uh, cyclocross races and um, yeah, I'm still like just so new to the sport. I'm learning so much. Every race that I do is a big learning step for me. And yeah, it's, it's just very exciting to learn a lot and I can't wait to improve. I know I can do so much better. I see so many points where I can improve and where I can work on. And I'm like in kind of an angry <laughs> state. I just want to like go and do it and like show what I'm actually able to do. Like, um, yeah, I just can't wait. And I'm so excited also now with Trek that they give me the opportunity to like have a professional surrounding. Like the, it's, it's like such a big step for me actually to just have everything ready. I can just come to the races and everything is rolling. So, um, and yeah, this just gives me even more motivation. I'm, I'm so excited for that. There are so many points from cyclocross that you can use in mountain biking. I mean, cornering or like sprinting out of the corners, even the bunny hops or like, there's a lot of stuff. Like also intensity wise, it's like 40 minutes full on. So it's a lot of intensity and I'm sure that will help me a lot in mountain biking. And yeah, just like handling the bike because you don't have any suspension on your cyclocross bike. So you need to be so gentle. You need to be like so precise with everything you do. So that's definitely gonna help my mountain bike riding. Road cycling is so exciting for me because it's just so different to mountain biking. Like in a mountain bike race, you kind of fight for your own race for 90 minutes. But in road cycling, there are so many other factors. Like you have to look at the other girls. There is like the, the course is very different all the time. You're not just doing laps and you have to be so alert. Um, like everything can happen, anything can happen. Uh, so for me, racing on the road is just very, very exciting. And also I think that for my training, it's a great help because the intensity is different. It's longer, but at the same time, it's more intense once there is an attack. So I think I can learn a lot from racing on the road. So I'm very excited to have the opportunity to race with the Trek Segafredo women's team. Um, it's like not 
my main priority because my main priority is mountain biking and will always be. That's what I love. That's how I grew up. Um, but I definitely want to improve on the road too. Like whenever I go there and I race, I can see like, ah, oh, if I can do this better, if I can do this better, I can improve. So I definitely want to improve on the road and like want to do like the big races together with the team. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I, I will always be the mountain biker. I'm so, so happy where I am right now with Trek. I feel like I have a really solid, like, support team around me. Like, I feel like everything is finally falling into place. Like, I am where I want to be. I have, like, the support on this, on this, on this. And, like, I feel like I can now just, like, work towards the future. And I have so many races that I want to win. Not many riders enjoy the kind of reception Stefan Kung receives when he races in his homeland, Switzerland. In cycle, caught up with the Groupama FTG rider at the Tour de Romandie, where he was very much the center of attention. I always loved uh, the races in Switzerland because uh, it's my home country. I know the road since I'm a little kid. I've done here, for example, the junior race. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it gives you that little bit of extra motivation. For sure, you always try to be motivated and for the big races like Flanders or Roubaix, you don't need that as well, but it's always special to, to ride in your home country because you have friends and families who come to the race. And on top of that, I always had uh, good results here. Breakaways are where the 25-year-old time trial specialist has earned those results, including his first World Tour win back in 2015 with BMC. There's a Flamme Rouge, one kilometre to go for Stefan Kuhn. Went with a breakaway early on today, and our Swiss colleagues are getting so excited. Yeah, I was a new pro. I had maybe five, six race days in my legs, and... Uh, I don't know, I was prepared for that victory because I, I, I analyzed the stage, I had a look at it in training and I, I, I asked the mechanics to put me on a 54 chain ring instead of 53 because the final was uh, slightly descending and uh, with a tailwind. So yeah, I was really prepared to win that stage, uh, which when I think about it now, uh, at the age of 21, uh, yeah, was pretty special. Stefan Kuhn in the black and red for BMC Racing, the young Swiss rider who won a similar stage from a breakaway at the Tour de Romandie two years ago. Andre Grifko just behind him. With Grifko, it was kind of the same story. I was super confident I was going to win. For me, it was no question. We got around the last corner, 300 meters to go, and I just launched my sprint. But this confidence came out of uh, some sprint battle that I had with Greg for now in training. And as I said to myself, at the end of a hard race, he's one of the best uh, finishers. So I was like, yeah, if I can beat Greg, then I can also as well beat Grifko. So I never even questioned and I just went for the line and yeah, it worked out. It was a uh, true, it, uh, it was really nice as well, this, this feeling. Kung was also a favorite to take the 2019 3.8-kilometer prologue. But the Swiss national TT champion had to instead settle for seventh place in the end. However, redemption would come on stage two. You always have to kind of pick out the stages where you, where you see you can uh, survive in the end. I only choose stages where I see myself uh, doing a good finish and being able to win this stage. So into the finish straight. An absolutely marvellous ride by one of the most talented men in the peloton. He knew there was a chance today, skin suited up, ready for action, and here he is to savour his moment. Four hours, ten minutes of terrific, torturous riding and Stefan Kuhn does it again, three times in the last four years.
As well as his stage hunting and TT skills, Kung has also shown promise in the cobbled classics. And with his off-season move from BMC to Group Armor FDJ earning him his own opportunities in such races, comparisons to fellow Swiss Fabian Cancellara are inevitable. Sure, Fabian was a really big figure in Swiss cycling for the last few years or almost a decade. And I mean, when I was a kid and I started racing my bike was 2004. It was the year he won the prologue, I think it was in Lüttich at the Tour de France. And yeah, I mean, it's something that inspired me, but in the end, uh, I know by now that I go my own way. So I, I would never even uh, compare like what he did when he was young, what I did when I was young, because each person has its own way. For sure, I want to do good in classics and I want to win time trials, so we have uh, certain similarities, but in the end, uh, you just have to take what life kind of throws at you. And, and uh, one thing's for sure, I'm going to go my own way. And that could include an eventual return to the track for the former individual pursuit world champion. Back in the days, track was my, my kind of first love, if you want. I, I enjoyed it a lot, the track racing, and I had uh, really nice success here yeah, with the World Championships title in 2015. I still do sometimes some kind of uh, club racing uh, on, on the track in Zurich. And uh, yeah, I mean, when I see the hour record kind of history, then I know with my track background, I would be in the in the routine pretty quickly. So yeah, it always kind of stays somewhere in the back of your mind. And uh, for the next two, three years, I think I have enough uh, goals to, to look for on the road. And if one day I, I need a new challenge, I will go back to track again. Set amid stunning landscapes, all cheered on by a passionate tifosi, the Giro d'Italia is always a highlight of the cycling season. With a pair of former winners of Vuelta a España champion and two of the hottest Grand Tour talents setting their sights on the iconic pink jersey, some have even started to wonder if the 102nd edition could be the best yet. I can sense a lot of anticipation for this Giro d'Italia because I think it's got a better field than the Tour de France. Most of the star stage races in the world are riding the Giro, and not only are they riding the Giro, but they are making the Giro their main target of the year. This year's parkour, you can't get away from the fact that, you know, at the start, the middle, and an end, there are time trials which are quite complicated in their, their kind of shape and route, which are going to have a huge impact on the you know, overall outcome of the race. The absolute favourites, it's very hard to pick. My head says Tom Dumoulin, purely because he's such a strong time trialist. He's so much better than most of the other contenders at time trialing, and he can defend in the mountains. With those three time trials, that makes the parkour his to win on. Having this 15 kilometer time trial on the final day is a huge advantage to Tom Dumoulin and a, and a huge problem for everybody else because it's almost like he has a virtual lead throughout the whole race. We saw, of course, when he did win the Giro on the final day, that that's exactly what happened, that, that he went into that final stage fourth at the time and leapfrogged from fourth to first. Dumoulin is a great climber as well, and, and when you drop Dumoulin, it does not mean that, that you've lost him for good. Um, he may well come back. You know, he's like Lazarus. He just refuses to die. Vincenzo Nibli is, he's the Grand Tour racer's Grand Tour racer, and he can't be written off. In 2016, most people thought he was past it, that he would never win another Grand Tour, and he won it in the most spectacular comeback you could possibly imagine. He is probably the most tenacious and crafty rider among all the contenders. His age is catching up with him a little bit. He doesn't look quite so sharp, and I think there are questions about his team and about his future on the team. So I don't get the sense that maybe we've got the same Nibali as we had in, in 2016. Maybe the stage 15, which is based around Como and the Giro di Lombardia, he will look at that stage, which 
doesn't have high mountains, but he will see that as an absolute prime opportunity to try and win the Giro. He's putting together a really incredible run of, of wins in week-long stage races, and he's ready now to step up and finish on the podium of a Grand Tour. He went very close to the Tour de France last year, but really he's got everything. I mean, he's got a very strong team, he's a brilliant time trialist, and he's a great climber. So, you know, <laughs> it, it's hard because you can find yourself talking about Tom Dumoulin saying, well, he's clearly the favourite, but then you look at him against Roglic and you think, well, where Where's Roglic going to lose time to De Moulin? He seems to have absolutely rock-solid confidence. He's got a very strong, very organised team, Jumbo Visma, which just seems to get better and better every year. He's controlled, he's strong, he won't be frightened by the parkour, and he's still improving. If he makes another improvement from last year, then he becomes not just a podium favourite, but an out-and-out -out pink jersey favourite. Well, Simon Yates at the 2018 Giro was phenomenal for 10 days. <laughs> uh, a bit more than 10 days, but he made too many efforts in the first sort of 10 days. Um, and he also then went too deep, perhaps, in the time trial itself to try and hold on to that pink jersey. And he really paid the price for that in the final few days of the, of the race. We saw what he learned from the Giro at the Vuelta, where he, he rode a far more measured three weeks and, and you know took the jersey at, the, at the, the best moment towards the end of the race. He's not got the strongest time trial. He, he can time trial okay and he's, he says himself he time trials very well for a guy of his size and power but he will concede time most likely on those three time trial stages. Lopez actually strung together two extremely strong grand tours last year and Again, he has a vulnerability in the time trial, but he's getting better every year, he's still quite young. And he has the climbing ability to, to win a Grand Tour, I'm sure. The team that he's on, Astana, are having an unbelievably good season. Uh, he's part of that, but they're a team that, that are on a real roll. And his performances last year at the, the Giro and the Vuelta, he's, he's a podium rider in a, in a Grand Tour, and perhaps not that far away from winning one. That's all for now, but do join us next time. Until then, keep up to date on social media.